Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, we always like to remind folks, because every day we get calls and letters that they just found us for the first time. So those of you who have been watching us for ever so long, remember that uh, we still have folks who know none of these things as I announce them. That is, that we're an informal Bible study. Uh, we have no denominational acts to grind. We're not going to attack anybody, but we just hopefully will help people to see what the book says. And uh, I think it's uh, accomplishing its purpose because I had someone call just this morning that that's what they appreciate. You aren't uh, sowing your own opinionated ideas. You're just simply showing us what the Word of God says. And that's my whole concept of teaching is to make it so clear that uh, there's no real room for argument. And again, we thank you for your financial help. We're not underwritten by anyone, remember. We don't have a big, large group of people underwriting us. We are just totally dependent on what comes in in the mail. And uh, it's amazing how God always supplies just what we need. And even as we take on new responsibilities, it immediately starts coming in. So we thank you from the depths of our heart and for your prayers and your concerns. Well, now today, uh, we're privileged again to have my oldest son, Greg, and his wife, Jeanette, with us. He's the one, of course, who ranches with me. And uh, he talks, and she does. Both of them now are uh, pretty active in the office and uh, talk to a lot of you folks out there in television on the phone. And uh, so we just wanted you to get a little glimpse of who you're talking to when you call in. And it's, he says, I always hear him say, this is Les's son. <laughs> And uh, Jeanette, his wife, of course, has become totally involved out in the office as well. And so we're proud of the kids. They're all part and parcel of the ministry. And uh, we show Iris. Did they get you last program? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to pick up where we left off. And uh, we're going to read again right from Isaiah 62, verse 1. And uh, we left off, I think, at the end of verse 3, but we're going to start our comments in verse 4, but I want to read from verse 1. All right, for again, for Zion's sake, for the sake of Jerusalem, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until... Now remember, we commented in our last taping, that's a time word. God is never content until the day comes that he will return and yet set up the kingdom promised to Israel. So I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. And you remember in the last program we pointed it out how that when the Jew is under the influence of the new covenant, nobody will have to ask, is that a believing Jew? They will all be just filled with the knowledge of God and his righteousness. All right, and thou shalt be called by a new name, a name which only God knows, and which the mouth of the Lord shall name in the future. <clears throat> thou shalt also be a crown of glory. Now just take this in its illustration, just like a, a jewel encrusted crown that royalty wears, so will be the nation of Israel in the eyes of God. And it will be like a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Now that's the promises to Israel. Now verse 4, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land be any more termed desolate. Now remember, those are capitalized. So what does that mean? That's what's being called. They're called forsaken. The land is being called desolate. All right, now I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to bring you back with me to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. And I guess while you're doing that, I'm going to put something back on the board again that may help concerning our, our timeline with these Isaiah and other prophets concerning the future. Now remember the first one that was evident 
a hundred years later, of course, but nevertheless, it's the one that was near term, so far as it was concerned, was 606 when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the city in Jerusalem, and then they went through 70 years of desolation. All right, the next great event, of course, was shortly after the crucifixion in 70 A.D., and much the same thing happened here with the Romans as happened back here with the Babylonians. And so now the Romans destroy the city, destroy the temple, and the Jew was again uprooted out of the land, only instead back here it was for 70 years, for here now it has been 1900 plus, or I suppose I should say 1800 plus, that might be a little more accurate. 1,800 plus years from the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman general Titus until the Jews started going back to the land and uh, recovering it from its desolation was over 1,800 years. All right, now the next great desolation will come just seven years leading up to the return of Christ, his second coming. And this seven years is also going to be a time of tremendous wrath, not desolation per se, like you have here and here, but it's going to be the outpouring of God's wrath and judgment and the return of Christ and then finally the glorious King and His kingdom. And then all these good things will finally become a reality. So maybe that will help. We're talking about two great desolations. The 70 years following the Babylonian captivity or follow the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, the 70 years of captivity. And then the next great event was 70 AD when the Romans came in and did the same thing. And then we had 1800 years of total desolation again. And then finally we come to the Seven years of the tribulation and the second coming. All right, now let's just read Leviticus 26, and you'll see what he's talking about. Leviticus 26, verse 32. And this, too, is written by Moses long before the Babylonians were even heard of. Uh, Leviticus, chapter 26, 32. And God says, I will bring the land. See how specific it is? I will bring the land into what? Desolation. What land? The promised land, the holy land, the land of Israel. I will bring it into desolation. It will be so desolate that your enemies which dwell therein, the few survivors that stick around, the Arabs in particular, the Bedouins and so forth, and they would look around them and just marvel at the desolation, how that nothing grows, nothing prospers. And for the first time, it was 70 years. And I'll show you in a minute how desolate it was at the end of the 70 years, but we'll read on first here. That the enemies that are staying behind will be astonished at it. And then verse 33, God will scatter them among the heathen, I will draw out a sword after you. They would be hated and persecuted and murdered. And your land shall be desolate. And your cities waste. Now that was the promise that God was going to do to Israel because of their unbelief, their idolatry, and their rejection of all the blessings of Jehovah. See? All right, so... I'm going to emphasize over and over, this wasn't just a one-time thing. The 70 years of desolation would be followed by the same kind of a desolation following the Roman destruction, only this one goes for 1,800 years where this was 70. All right, now I've done this before in some of my seminars and uh, some of my class here in Oklahoma, but if those of you out in television will bear with me, I want you to just uh, listen to me as I read just a few words from a book written by Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, the same guy that wrote Huckleberry Finn. And he was traveling in the Holy Land in the 1860s. Now, don't forget that date, 1860s, about the time of our Civil War. And this is what he wrote, and I'm going to read. It's from a book that he wrote that was titled The Innocents Abroad. 
and uh, I'm going to give credit for it. Here it is. The soil is rich enough, but it is given completely to weeds. A desolation. Now watch the words that old Mark Twain uses. And he wasn't knowledgeable of Scripture, I'm sure of that. But it's the same kind of language. There is a desolation here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. Now watch this. We never saw a human being on the whole route. We pressed toward Jerusalem. The further we went, the hotter the sun got, the more rocky and bare and repulsive and dreary the landscape became. Does that tell you what it looked like? There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. Jerusalem is lifeless. Now, do you hear that? That's from the pen of a man like Mark Twain, picturing the Holy Land in its desolation. All right? It is a heartbroken land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its field and fettered its energies. It is desolate and unlovely. And can the curse of a deity beautify a land? Palestine, or what we call the Holy Land, is no more of this workaday world. And you see, it stayed that way from 70 A.D. all the way up until the late 1800s when the Jews, almost a sprinkling of them, started going back because of the persecution and the pogroms that were taking place in the other areas of the world and began to clear the land of the rocks and the rubbish and began to plant trees. Now the last number I read, Israel has planted three hundred and some million trees since they have come back to the land. And out of that abject desolation now, we see the land is once again, even as it will be far more so during the kingdom, becoming a rose in the desert. It's just coming into full production. But I want you to understand that when God speaks of the the promised land of Israel as a desolation, it's just not a play on words. It means what it says. Now, the first inkling we had of it, the first time Iris and I went over there was in 1975, and I'll never forget, we were driving along the Jordan Valley, and nothing but desolation on both sides of the road, and I even commented to her, I said, Honey, how in the world can the Bible call this place the land of promise? Who would want it? <laughs> I mean, there's just nothing there. Well, then when we went back in the early 90s, and you see, it was a great transformation. Irrigation, there were large wheat fields, there were all kinds of citrus groves and almond groves and everything, and you could just see that the land was starting to blossom, like I said, like a rose. What a difference. But it came out of abject desolation. And this is what I want people to understand. And then when oh, Arafat would used to say, it has always been a verdant. That was the word he liked to use. A verdant or a green land. No, it wasn't. It was total desolation. All right, now just to show you how desolate it was even at the end of the 70 years, come up with me. We may have done this not too long ago. Come up with me to Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is right after, let's see, the Chronicles, the Kings, the Chronicles. And then you come to Ezra, and then Nehemiah. I'll help you find it that way. And I want to jump in, honey, at, uh, oh, let's see. Let's jump in at chapter 2. I thought I was going to finish Isaiah today, but there's no way, so there's no use even trying. So we might as well take what time we need for some of these other things. Nehemiah, chapter 2. Let's just jump in at verse 11. Now, this is shortly after the 70 years that they were out of the land in the Babylonian captivity. In fact, it's a little more than a year later. It's almost 70, 80 years later that Nehemiah comes. But now just look at the language so that you can see that it wasn't a temporary thing. 
When the Jews left, the Arabs didn't come in and build it up and put it in production. No, it just stays desolate. And then when the Jews come back and begin to produce higher help, then the Arabs come back. I mean, that's the way it's always been. All right, now, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11. Nehemiah says, So I came to Jerusalem, that is, from way back out in the Euphrates Valley. And I arose in the night, and I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Now remember, what was God's instructions to Nehemiah? Rebuild the city wall and the gates. Ezra had come almost 100 years back to build the temple. But now Nehemiah comes by God's instruction and with the decrees from Artaxerxes the king to rebuild the city wall and the gates. Now what's the purpose? Well, you can't have an entity of any worth without defense. You know, we were just talking about it last night. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could just dispense with all of our military. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to worry about our borders and we could just live in peace and tranquility? It doesn't work that way. You have to maintain the defense of what you have. And Israel was no different. And so God instructed Nehemiah, you go back and build the city wall and the gates. Why? For defense. You can't sit out there on the open hills. The enemy will come and run you over. And so that was the first instruction. Go and rebuild the wall. All right, read on. Verse 13, So I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port. Those were all various gates on the city wall previously. And I viewed or overlooked the walls of Jerusalem, which were what? Broken down. Seventy and a hundred years later, they're still just laying there in disarray, broken down. And the gates thereof were consumed with fire, which meant what? Nothing but charred wood laying at what should be a gateway. All right, verse 14. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. But there was no place for the beast that was under me. He was probably riding on a donkey. There wasn't any place for the beast to pass. In other words, if there was a, a, a pool of water or a creek or something, the beast had no bridge to cross it. All right, then verse 15. Then I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and then returned. Verse 16. The rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews or the priests, who remember now have been there for about oh, almost 100 years building and rebuilding the temple, nor did the nobles or the rulers did they know anything that he had been out surveying what needed to be done? All right, now verse 17. Now I'm doing all this so that you get a vivid picture of how desolate Jerusalem was, even though they've been there a hundred years working on the temple, but so far as the, the uh, secular end of the city, it was a shambles. Okay, verse 17. Then I said unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth, what? Waste. Waste. It wasn't a thriving city, and it lieth waste. The gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a what? A reproach. What's that mean? Well, you don't even have a wall to defend your cities. You can't sleep at night. Your enemies can just walk in and take you over. That's a reproach. Well, now listen, it means the same thing today. You cannot be a pacifist and survive because it's just normal human behavior to take what the next man has if it's better than your own. And it works with nations as it does with individuals. That's why we have to have law and order. That's why we have to have a defense system. You cannot be a pacifist in this world under the curse. It won't work. All right, now read on. Verse 18, So I told them of the hand of my God who was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken. Now, well, we didn't take the time to read the earlier verses, but what did King Artaxerxes tell him? 
when Nehemiah said, I want to go back and rebuild the city wall, oh, Artaxerxes the king says, make out a list of requirements. Tell us what you need and we'll supply. And so this is what Nehemiah is going on. All right. So he says, I told him of the king's words that he had spoken. And so the Jews now that he's addressing said, what? Let's build. Let's get with it. See? So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now verse 19. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, and the Ammonite. Now what's an Ammonite? Well, he's an Arab. And then read on. And Geshem, the Arabian. So what have you got? The opposition again from the Arab world, just like it is today. And this is back here in about 450 B.C. All right. And so Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it. They what? They laughed us to scorn. They despised us. And they said, what is this that you're trying to do? Are you going to rebel against the king? Poor people didn't know that the king was the one that was sponsoring it. See? But see, see, attitudes haven't changed one iota. Verse 20, Then I answered and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. Now I'll take note of the last part. In which you, now who is he talking to? The Arabians in which you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Now, isn't that plain? There isn't an Arab on this earth that has any claim to one square foot of Jerusalem. It's the promised land, and it was promised to God's covenant people Israel. All right, now we've got the same scenario coming back today. They've been in desolation for over 1,800 years. And I say 1,800 because you see 70 AD is almost the end of the first century. And it wasn't until the late 1800s or about 1900 that the Jews started sprinkling back into uh, what we call Palestine or the area of Israel. And now since 1900, Yes, they've been clearing the land. They've been increasing the irrigation. It's blooming like a rose in the desert. And uh, Israel has come as far as she has come by God's grace and getting ready. And that's what I want folks to see. Everything that you're seeing in the Middle East, whether it's Israel or the Arab world or the oil or whatever else, it's all getting ready for the end time events that are staring us in the face. Okay, now let's see. I think that's enough for that for the time being. And we'll go back up again to Isaiah chapter 62, where again, remember, the Lord has promised now that they will no longer be called forsaken because he will have returned. He will now be their king. He's bringing in this glorious kingdom. They will no longer be called desolate because now the land is going to flow literally with milk and honey as the expression. And I think I've explained it before. You know what it means to flow with milk and honey? It doesn't mean that milk is going to come down the rivers. Honey isn't going to come down off the mountains. So where does the term come from? Well, everything that an environment needs to supply an abundance of milk and an abundance of honey means you have to have what? You have to have grass and water for the cows to produce the milk. And if you're going to have an abundance of honey, you have to have an abundance of what? Blossoms, fruit blossoms, flower blossoms. And so the two concepts together means the land is just going to be productive beyond comprehension. It's going to be literally flowing with milk and honey, but not sticky honey as such, but all the flowering trees and flowers and so forth. Not necessarily white milk coming down the river, but all the abundance of what it will take to produce it. And that's Israel's future. It's coming. All right, only got a couple, three minutes left. So it'll no longer be called desolate, but flip side. Now we're going to make a series of programs someday on all the buts in Scripture. And... Uh, 
You know, it's amazing how the Lord intervenes. I've been kind of dreading looking up all of the buts in Scripture, the B-U-T's. And you know what came in the mail the other day? A guy did it for me. <laughs> he sent a sheet, a sheaf that thick with all the buts from Genesis to Revelation. So all I'm going to have to do is just go through and pick out the ones that I can put on the program. And I just said, thank you, Lord. He probably saved me about 10 hours of intense study trying to find them all. I'll show them to you when we get home, John. Okay. But here we go. It will be called Hephzibah, which means the one in whom is my delight. It's, a re it's actually the, the queen's name of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah termed her the one in whom I delight. Well, that's what God is going to use to call Israel. And the land will not be called desolate, but what? Beulah, to whom God is married once again. That's what the term means. For the Lord delighteth in thee, like Hezekiah did in his wife, and thy land shall be future, what? Married. God is once again going to be so involved with the physical, earthly aspect of Israel's lifestyle. All right, now then verse 5. For as a young man marrieth his virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. This is going to be a relationship now between God and the nation of Israel. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over thee. But it's all future. This hasn't ever happened yet. Israel has never been in that kind of a place of obedience. But it's coming. It's coming. You know, there's something that, that has really got my attention, and I want all of you, even out there in television, to be aware of it. There is seemingly a spiritual awakening taking place in the land of Israel. And a lot of the Israelis are actually turning to Christ. Now, again, I'm in no place to judge the authenticity of their salvation, but it's kind of exciting when you get the reports of how many Israelis are now becoming open to the gospel. And so I, I just can't help but share it that this is all telling us one thing. The end is coming close, and it can't be very much longer. Now, I'm not sensational. I don't say next year or five years, but in terms of time, no, it's not going to be very much longer. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.